All right. Welcome to our Vet Girl YouTube live event. Super excited to be here with all of you today. Boy, I was just saying to Dr. St. Denis and Dr. Lee, holidays are coming up. It's getting a little crazy, a little stressful. I don't know if you're feeling that as well. I certainly am. That's why I'm using my virtual background. Behind me is a wrapping paper disaster. <laughs> you maybe hear my cat crinkling that behind us, but we're going to be talking about top tips for managing FIC. My name is Garrett Pachtinger. I'm a criticalist and the co-founder of VetGirl. And as I look out my window behind my monitor, I am logging in from a cloudy, cold Pennsylvania. But Justine, I don't think it's as cold as where you are. Where are you today? I'm based out of a beautiful, sunny St. Paul, Minnesota. And it is about 25 degrees Fahrenheit, and we have a couple of inches of snow. It's our first snowfall, so it is absolutely beautiful. <laughs> and Dr. St. Denis, where are you logging in from today? I am logging in from Northern Ontario in Canada, and we have a lot of snow here, probably a few inches, and it's minus 12 Celsius. So that'll be a bit of a throw for all of you. I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit. Celsius. I need my, oh, abacus. Cool. I need my <laughs> abacus to get that. Well, <laughs> It's pretty cool. If I'm looking, I'm looking at the the chat right now, and you are all pros. You know we love when you type in where you are logging in from, and I'm seeing a ton of people typing in where they're logging in from. We have New York City, Massachusetts, British Columbia, California, Jersey, Eastern Washington. Let's see, Tennessee, Ohio. List goes on. Please go ahead and continue to type in where you are logging in from because we all absolutely love, love, love to see it. And while you're doing that, I'm going to go ahead and get started on a little bit of our Veckerl housekeeping. First of all, you all know that we are very excited to have Royal Canaan here with us today. They are an amazing educational partner with Veckerl and We've always said whenever we have the benefit, the fortune of a great educational partner, we're absolutely happy to provide completely free race approved CE. So thank you to Royal Canaan for being here with us today and allowing us to give out and get CE. With that said, how are you going to get your CE? Two different ways. One is you can use your fancy smartphone and put it right on that QR code, your camera feature. It opens up the form. Or if you don't have that fancy smartphone, you can type in and Justine will put it in the comments in a second. But if you type in tinyurl.com forward slash VG, obviously standing for a vet girl, and then today's date, 12 5, 23, it will open that form. It is just about 12 o'clock Eastern now. We're going to end around 12.30 or so. And we're going to keep the form open until 1 p.m. Eastern. So you will have about 30 minutes after the end of the session to fill out that form if you don't want to miss a darn thing we're saying. So and we'll remind you a little bit later about getting C. But again, thanks to Royal Canaan. And make sure you fill out that form importantly, using your VetGirl associated email address. So the email you use to log into your VetGirl account. Because we're on YouTube, we know sometimes those YouTube screens can be a little bit small. If you click that bottom right little open box, it will make YouTube big. Your entire screen, full screen, may be nicer to view. If you're not a VetGirl member, or you are, we certainly hope you're taking part in our VetGirl certificate programs. They are, these are part of your membership, and really it's a great way to become more proficient in an area that interests you, whether you're brushing up on ER, anesthesia, ophthalmology, urinary disease, the list goes on. Please make sure you're taking part in checking out our certificate programs. We have 13 active that are part of your VetGirl membership. If you're not a VetGirl member, Try out our trial membership. It's a completely free, no credit card required, 14-day access to watch anything on our site. It's a great opportunity, so check out our trial membership. And please, I don't want to hear later that you had FOMO, you have fear of missing out, you couldn't be with us. You know there's nothing better than Vet Girl, jazz music, and beignets. So make sure you check out Vet Girl U, which is going to be in New Orleans this summer. Super excited, and we do have our early bird pricing in effect until January 1st, so make sure you sign up and register now with that early bird pricing. All right. I know you're not here to listen to me, and technically not Justine either. We're here to listen to Dr. St. Denis talk, so Dr. Denis, St. Denis, thank you again for being here with us today. If you can give our audience a little bit of a background of who you are, what you love to do, and then please take it away. The floor is yours. Well, thank you so much to both Becker and Royal Canin for inviting me today. I am Dr. Kelly St. Denis. 
I am a board certified feline specialist in feline practice with the American Board of Veterinary Practitioners. Some of you may know me as a consultant on the Veterinary Information Network, but I am also medical co-editor of the AFP's Feline Practitioner Magazine and co-editor of the Journal of Feline Medicine and Surgery. So I do wear many hats, but I also am in clinical practice. Um, and so I'm very excited to talk to everyone today about feline idiopathic cystitis. So again, thank you so much uh, to Royal Canin and Becquerel for, for sponsoring this today and having me here. So we have a lot of information to go over today. So I'm very excited to launch right in. We're, you know, for our objectives today, we're going to talk about the role of stress in feline idiopathic cystitis. And I want to explore the five pillars of a healthy feline environment because they are critical to all of our feline patients, not just the ones with FIC. But we're going to look at how to identify and correct deficiencies in those five pillars as an approach to stress reduction for those FIC patients. And then we're going to review some management strategies in addition to the five pillars for that for those patients. <clears throat> so let's just talk a little bit about what feline idiopathic cystitis is. I and mean, we're all very familiar with this term and idiopathic tends to mean we don't know what it what is causing it. But we do have some increased understanding of FIC and we're going to talk about that today. We do know from multiple studies over the last two decades that FIC is the most common cause of feline lower urinary tract disease and specifically non-obstructive. And these patients can present as obstructed, but they are most commonly going to show up as a non-obstructive FLUTD. We do know also that it is a diagnosis of exclusion, which makes it a lot of fun. It means we need to go through all of the list of things that can cause FLUTD from urolithiasis to crystalluria to feline urinary tract infection and so on. So we need to rule all of those problems out before we can make our FIC diagnosis. And we have to remember that those are not mutually exclusive. So some patients may have, um, let's say a bladder stone, but also have FIC. So we work at treating what we see and we see what's left. Generally speaking, FIC is going to present as an acute self-limiting problem. But unfortunately, if we're not dealing with those um, repeated episodes of FIC that are occurring with these acute self-limiting, we can see this progress to a chronic disease, which can have multiple flare-ups in short periods of time. And this is when cats can really get into trouble. We might also see other sickness behaviors associated with FIC or just in general. So we may see gastrointestinal upset, lower immune system, which can lead to flare-ups of things like feline herpes virus um, and dermatologic problems as a few examples. So one of the things that we do understand about FIC is that it really is a result of complex interactions between the urinary bladder, the nervous system, the adrenal system, and then husbandry practices and the environment in which the cat lives. And really what that means is that the urinary bladder in a way is a little bit of an innocent bystander in all of this. So if we think about stress on a day-to-day -day basis and we talk about a healthy feline individual, every day they're going to be exposed to different stimulus or challenge. So for example, something, someone coming into the home um, may cause a little bit of fear and anxiety. So we're gonna see in that purple box, you know, that stimulus of challenges, that lightning rod, that purple box, the cat's going to experience what we call protective emotions. And that might be fear, it might be anxiety or frustration. And for a healthy individual, they're going to have those emotions, they're gonna cope with those emotions, maybe they're gonna run and hide, and then they're gonna recover uneventfully. But unfortunately for cats that are prone to FIC, we will see that they have an exaggerated SNS response and catecholamine release. But at the same time, they're also having a blunted endocrine response and cortisol response. And this inability to handle those day-to-day -day stressors can predispose them to what we see as deranged health. So although stress and the environment are not necessarily enough to cause a flare up or cause FIC, when these cats are susceptible and they're in deficient environments, then FIC is more likely to occur. And I like to quote Dr. Tony Buffington, who is one of the main researchers behind understanding stress and FIC. And he likes to say that these are sensitive cats in a provocative environment. So one of the things that we can do when we talk about FIC is to try and figure out what are the predisposing factors that might be contributing to FIC and which ones can we adjust to try and help that cat with FIC. So if we look on the left, we can see a number of red characteristics or predisposing factors that we are not able to change. So for example, we can't change the cat's genetics or how they express their genes through epigenetics. We're not able to change their sex or their neuter status. 
and they may have experienced early life events that have affected their ability to handle stress. We know that cats that are predisposed to FIC are usually between around two and seven years of age, and we obviously can't change their age. And then when we think about indoor status as a predisposing factor, it's not like we're going to ask our clients to start putting their cat outside so that they don't have FIC as often, right? If they're indoors, we want to keep them there. So that we can shift over to the other side of the slide and look at those green bars or picket fences, I like to, like to call them. And these are things that we can actually manage. So these risk factors like the cat's environment, the cat's husbandry, we can look at stress in a multi-cat household. And then we also know that obesity, diet, and water intake are things that will predispose and are things that we can adjust to improve FIC. So I want to start by looking at the first three picket fences in that list of things that we can adjust. And I want to start by rolling into the five pillars of a feline healthy environment. And these were first presented in the 2013 AAFP and ISFM feline environmental needs guidelines. And you can access that at catvets.com. Free access is all of our guidelines are open access to everyone. So if we look at these five pillars, these are the essential needs of every cat in every, in every household. So this is not about environmental enrichment. This is the bare minimum. And we're going to go and look at each of these in individually and discuss them. And so I'm going to talk about them in, in light of we, what we see with this environment, husbandry, and stress in a multi-cat household. So pillar one describes providing a safe place. And I always like to remind everyone that it's not how we perceive a safe place, but it actually is what the cat perceives as being safe. So we want them to feel like they're free from predation. So we have to think about other indoor pets that might be upsetting them or stressing them out or posing a risk to them. There may be humans in the household that are not interacting with that cat in a respectful way and therefore causing them some stress and anxiety. And then we also need to consider outdoor threats. So we often think, well, the cat's indoors, the doors are locked, the windows are closed. It's not like something can come inside, but our cats don't understand that. So if they do see a predator outside or they smell that a tomcat has sprayed at the front door, they're not gonna understand that that cat can't come in and cause them some issues. We also want them to feel that they're free from the threat to their resources. So again, we need to consider all those factors that, uh, that we talked about under predation. So the other indoor pets, humans in the household, and then again, those animals that are outdoors that might be threatening to come in and eat their resources, eat their food, sleep in their beds. It's like Goldilocks and, and the three bears, right? So then we also want to think about the freedom to choose. So we're going to try to provide those cats with safe places to hide, like beds, boxes, vertical spaces, for example. And we want those cats to be allowed at will to go and experience those places when they need to, if they're having fear and anxiety. So for example, if someone comes in, a repairman into the house and the cat wants to hide, or we have house guests, we let the cat go and hide and we don't pull them out of that hiding place and force them to interact with the people who are in the home causing fear and anxiety. And we let those cats initiate interactions and we let them terminate interactions when they're comfortable. When we look at pillar two, we're talking about multiple and separated key environmental resources. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we're all gonna know this one because we often talk about litter boxes. When we see people that have cats that are house soiling, FIC, we'll talk about all the litter box criteria and say we need one litter box per cat plus one extra, and they need to be in multiple areas of the home. But in reality, we need to think about all the other resources that cats need. So I like to think about core resources. So yes, litter boxes are a core resource where they can urinate and defecate, but also their food and water allow them those basic biological functions. So they need to have multiple places to eat, especially in a multi-cat household. And the same applies for water. Then we can also look at non-core resources, and that's anything that promotes the normal cat behaviors. So scratch surfaces, sleeping places, safe places, vertical perches, toys, etc. And even our individual people that are interacting or the loved humans in the home can kind of be like a resource. And in a multi-cat household can serve some areas of constraint between the two cats if they're competing for attention. So again, those things need to be throughout the home in multiple areas so that the cats feel they have ample resources and they have options to choose if they can't get to one of them. Pillar three is provide opportunity for play and predatory behavior. So naturally outside, the cat's going to hunt throughout their waking hours to catch and consume sufficient nutrition. It's a lot of work to be a predator when you're a cat. 
their meals are short in calories and it takes a number of meals to meet up their caloric needs for the day. So when we feed them in a bowl, although I wrote the word boring here, it just really isn't fulfilling their, their prey behavior, their predatory behavior, their, their needs in terms of hunting. And so we wanna look at ways to enhance play and predatory behavior. So first of all, we like to provide our cats with toys. Our caregivers are really good at doing this. And we wanna try rotating the toys. And I find cats naturally do that anyways because they push them all under the couch and then we find them a couple of weeks later and rotate the toys. But we also want our caregivers to engage in play sessions with their cat. So um, using toys, not hands or feet, uh, we want them to at least five minutes twice a day uh, is preferable so that they're actually doing some engaging play sessions with the cat, which will really also help fulfill those predatory behavior needs. And then finally, we want caregivers to look at the option for puzzle feeders so that we're putting some of that cat's meal, if not all of it, into things that make them work for their food. And again, are working up those predatory um, behaviors in, and that really helps with those instincts. One of the most important and most difficult is going to be providing positive, consistent and predictable human cat social interaction. So we know cats engage, uh, domestic cats engage socially with humans. They like being around their humans, but humans are still a potential threat to their safety. And if we think about this, there may be some humans in the household that are really not interacting with that cat in a consistent or appropriate way. So they might be holding the cat inappropriately. They might be um, harming the cat when they're holding the cat and doing certain things to them. And so this can cause fear, anxiety, can cause frustration. And those types of stress, of course, are going to potentially predispose to a flare up of FIC. And even in a cat that is otherwise healthy, we may see undesirable behaviors occurring as a result of those inappropriate interactions. So we really need to make sure that everyone in the home is on board with respectful interactions with the cat. Last but not least is respecting the cat's sense of smell and their other senses. And this is where we start to think about the fact that the cat is actually a prey species. They're not just a predator, they are a prey species. And so even within the safety of their own home, they have to be on vigilance at all times to be ensured that they're not going to be consumed by a predator at any moment. And so they need their full use of their vision and they need full use of their scent and they need to be able to hear. And so if we have a lot of scents like scented cat litter, as we see, yes, pumpkin spice litter is a thing. Um, if we have those things in our home, we're actually potentially obstructing the cat's ability to smell. And by the same token, loud um, loud noises, loud music, bright lights, flashing lights, these things can all potentially disturb the cat's senses um, and limit their ability to detect a predator. <clears throat> so when we talk about the five pillars, what we're doing with uh, that the conversation with our caregivers is trying to identify where there are deficiencies in those five pillars. And we'll see with Dr. Tony Buffington's research that he um, has done some studies where they looked at identifying deficiencies in the cat's environment and changing that particular individual cat's environment based on those deficiencies. And what he called that was multimodal environmental modification. And when they did this publication, the five pillars I don't think had been published at that point, but when you marry the two things together, it makes a lot of sense because that's really what they were talking about is identifying those deficiencies in the five pillars educating the clients and changing that individual cat's environment based on the needs of that individual cat and how their deficiencies in the five pillars exist. Something that's very special, we kind of talked about briefly with in terms of the five pillars, we talked about the multi-cat household, resources especially, but multi-cat households can, households can be an added stressor to a cat like with FIC. And generally speaking, because cats are obligate carnivores and they hunt on their own, they are asocial as a species. So, so many people get another cat because they think their cat needs a friend. And we do know that cats can develop bonds with other cats, but very often they're just coexisting in a shared territory. Um, the signs of friend versus foe can be really subtle. And of course, if cats are not really the best of friends, and even when they are friends, if we have deficiencies in the five pillars, especially with the pillar two, and we're talking about resources, we're potentially going to see increased stress, increased uh, conflict between those cats. 
So one of my favorite videos on YouTube is this friend or foe. And you can find this on YouTube just by um, searching on YouTube friend or foe cat. Um, and you'll see that there's a nice little video. It's less than two minutes long. And it really um, will highlight to your caregiver. I get my caregivers to watch this. What is a friend? What are two friend cats in the environment? And what are foes? And then it also starts to talk about that environment and how we can make a happy space for cats to live in harmony. If cats are friends, we're going to see that they engage in facial rubbing or body rubbing. They may be tail wrapping and nose touching. We'll also have the caregiver tell us that they're resting or sleeping in physical contact or close proximity. Now, I always have to dig deeper into this one because people will tell me they're sleeping on the same bed, but then we may find out that they're sleeping on opposite ends of the bed and that's not a friend behavior. That's just them trying to be on the bed with a human, but they don't want to be near each other. We will also see them engaging in allo grooming, so they will groom each other and they will play together. And cats that are kind of coexisting or are actually living as foes will live in separate areas of the house, hence we need so many resources throughout the home, and unfortunately may also engage in hissing, growling, and confrontational stares. We're not going to see a lot of fighting with cats. Cats actually don't like to fight because that also puts them at risk of harm, so they do try to leave that to a last possible resort but we may see them time sharing resources. So one cat may use a bed and then it gets up from its nap and another cat will come in and use that bed. I've also seen cats that are resource blocked. They may sit in front of a door and prevent another cat from accessing food or accessing a litter box, for example, or even monopolizing resources. Obesity is another well-established risk factor for FIC, but also as really for feline lower urinary tract disease in general. And obesity is an epidemic issue in the US, in Canada as well for our cats. And unfortunately it starts really early on in their life. And when we're seeing these patients early, you know, in their first year, those are the cats we know are for sure gonna come see us because they're getting their first sets of vaccines, they're getting their spay neuter, and hopefully we can get them to come back for annual care. But that's the time that we really wanna work at prevention of obesity. And so we're not just going to, you know, tell them that they need to have the cat on kitten food. We're gonna spend some time discussing appropriate nutrition, what intake is required, and when to switch to an adult food and how to do that. Of course, when we see patients that are starting to gain weight and have an increased body condition score, we really want to set to managing that right away. And that isn't just when I see you next year, I hope the cat has lost some weight or you should try a low calorie diet. It's really helpful if we can move to having some type of nutritional program for the cat, where maybe we have one team member or a couple of team members who really are into nutrition and can help um, the caregiver sort of approach this weight loss program. So yes, we're going to address those medical needs, but we're also going to look at emotional and cognitive needs based on the five pillars. We might need to choose an appropriate therapeutic diet for the cat. And then we're going to calculate out their resting energy requirements and look at what they're actually eating and figure out what they need to eat to lose weight without becoming nutrient deficient. We're going to do regular weigh-ins. Again, we're not going to wait till next year because that cat may have gained two pounds by the time we see them again. And we want to use the body condition scores and muscle condition scores also to trend their success. And of course, each time we see them, we might need to adjust their feeding protocols. So this is an ongoing process that needs repeat management. We also may need to look at therapeutic, therapeutic diets, both for our obese patients, but in particular for our FIC patients. So again, we might have targeted diets for weight management and loss that will be appropriate for that cat. And I certainly see this commonly in practice these days that a lot of people are feeding very high caloric density diets. And when we start to cut those back to meet the cat's resting energy requirements, sometimes they can end up in a nutrition deficiency. So we really want to look at those weight management diets, which are geared towards restricting calories, but not causing nutrition deficiencies. We're also going to look at targeting for urinary tract health, makes a lot of sense. And we're going to try to choose for our FIC patients those, those diets that have nutrients that help the cat cope with everyday stressors. So our multifunction urinary SO Calm from Royal Canin is a good example. And the Hills MultiCare Stress are, is another example of a food that we can choose that meets that criteria. Our patients may have other comorbidities, so we may have to choose our diets that are specific to those comorbidities or a combination protocol. 
Increased water intake is critical in our FIC patients. So by promoting increased water intake, we're going to increase urine volume, increase urine frequency, and really reduce that urine specific gravity. Canned food's probably the best way for us to do this. We know cats are very efficient at eating their water as they do out in the wild when they're eating a mouse or a bird. Um, and so if we have them on canned food and we can increase their canned food intake, or if they are willing to eat canned food and we can add it to their regime, that can be very helpful. But we're also going to look at patient specific preferences. So cats have very unique preferences for their water. They may like those wide open bowls like we see with Ceta in the middle uh, and pitcher there on the side. Um, or they may like a flowing type of water where we have a cat actually using a fountain to promote their drinking. We're also going to see some really weird preferences like the cat in the bottom right from Dr. Sarah Caney, where we actually see the cat drinking out of a mug. And I have had a number of caregivers tell me that their cats do prefer to drink out of glasses. So as long as we're making sure they have fresh water the way they like it, they will hopefully drink more. And then we can also use therapeutic diets that are targeted to reduce the USG um, and or increase water consumption. So if a cat's not really into the canned food and they need to consume dry, products like the Walt, um, Royal Canin Urinary SO are going to actually, even in the dry formulation, improve water consumption. So I guess the next question is always going to be, what about our drugs? Um, so of course, we're going to talk about managing those FIC flare-ups. And most of those patients, what they're going to need is multimodal analgesia. We're not going to be prescribing antibiotics unless we have documented a urinary tract infection through a culture sensitivity. It's mostly that when they're coming in, they're in a degree of pain and will need multiple analgesic types of drugs to help them do that FIC flare-up. Of course, if they have associated FLUTD issues, we're going to manage those as well, and any comorbidities with medications that are required. Of course, we also see commonly that people want to start psychotropic medications. So maybe nutraceuticals, omega-3 fatty acids, for example, um, L-theanine, any of the things that we can supplement the diet with that will help, but also anxiolytics and things like SSRIs and TCAs. So psychotropic medications, as much as we want to try and reach for these early on in the process, they really aren't our first therapy to choose. Really, really, I find success in addressing the medical, dietary, environmental, and resource concerns first. So I work my way through those five pillars. I adjust the diet as needed and address any of those risk factors that we've already talked about that can make a difference for those cats. We're not gonna use medication as a sole therapeutic strategy, even if we do choose to use it, it should be used as an adjunct only. And we always have to remember that things like SSRIs can take days to weeks to take effect. So the SSRIs can take as many as six weeks to take effect. And by no means are we going to leave an FIC cat with no other support um, without, um, with just drugs so we're for that long so we're definitely going to try to work on all the other things that are going on in that cat's home and environment and like any behavior drug they're hopefully not intended for long-term use the goal is to get the cat through the worst and adjust the environment and diet as needed so that we can get them off the drugs so to conclude as we've concluded in the last uh, brief time that we've been talking, FIC is a very complex disease and it's very individual. It's going to impact cats in a different way depending on the environment they're in. So I really find that holistic approach to care for FIC for each patient is ideal. We have to look at everything that's going on in their lives and the individual cat. Of course, we're going to manage those pain and related clinical signs, and we're going to look at those risk factors and address them as best as we can to reduce it. And finally, uh, in my experience, those five pillars and the multimodal environmental modification are going to give us the best success for getting that cat's life balanced and having better well-being. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Garrett, I'll let you jump in first before I tackle mm -hmm. questions. First of all, absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. St. Denis. Awesome information. Um, again, thank you to Royal Canaan. As we said in the beginning of the session, without their support, this would not be possible. So please make sure to thank your local Royal Canaan rep or 
not local, international potentially, because we have some international friends with us. With that said, as I said, free race approved CE. So I'm going to go ahead and put up our race CE. So how do you get your race CE certificate for this event? You can either use your fancy smartphone and that QR code feature or type into the website, your URL bar. Justine put it in our chat as well, tinyurl.com forward slash VG for Vector, obviously VG and then today's date, 12-5-23. That form will remain open for the next 30 minutes. When you fill out that form, please make sure that you use the email address associated with your Vet Girl online account. Your certificate will automatically be placed in your credits dashboard when you use that email address. So again, thank you so much. I'll pass it to Justine. I'll leave this up for a couple of minutes for people for, for uh, uh, their CE form, but I'll pass it to Justine and we'd love to get through some of your questions. Please type them in. Awesome. Thank you so much, Garrett. And Dr. St. Denis, thank you so much. Absolutely. Always love doing feline CE. And again, a huge shout out and thank you to Royal Canaan for sponsoring today's YouTube live event. Um, you know, great, great points. You brought up so much about clean water and increasing water content. Um, I'm with you. I'm a huge advocate um, of training cats to eat canned food because we've all had those cats that are hospitalized that don't eat canned food. Mm -hmm. They only eat dry food. And so for newly adopted cats or kittens, I always recommend canned food. And I personally, for my own cats, gruel it down with some hot water to teach them to increase their water intake. And that works. It, it yeah. really teaches them to drink that slurry. But I see a couple of questions about it. Would you suggest adding tuna can water uh, with water in, to encourage drinking um, chicken broth? Or is there potential protein content in issue or even the salt content? What do you recommend? I think with anything like that, we certainly have the option of adding flavorings like tuna water or chicken broth. We just probably want to choose a low sodium, although we don't have any specific evidence to show that sodium is a huge problem in cats. I don't think we want the higher sodium stuff that we tend to use in our soups and broths and things. Um, so yeah, adding something like that to water to help cats consume more water is going to be beneficial. Um, and even things like PVD hydrocare is an option as well. And I also recommend as you do, Justine, as you've said, if people have their cat eating canned food, you can try adding a little bit, even just to start a teaspoon here and there of water to the canned food, again, to increase the amount of water that they're eating as opposed to having to drink it. You know, it's so interesting. My husband, when we first started dating, he's like, why do you have this hot water heater going constantly? <laughs> and it's for my cats. So they have, you know, hot water that's mixed in with the cold canned food in the refrigerator. And um, my cats love it. So I, I love great that. Great idea. Like Any it. comments on cats that prefer puddles to clean water uh, in a clean bowl? That's an interesting one. So I'm assuming these cats are going outside. And I think if there's some way to mimic that in the home where maybe you have multiple vessels throughout the home that have lower amounts of water, that might be that they like to have the less deep water available. You may have to look at doing that. And that's always going to depend on the type of household you live in. If you've got some dogs, they may just lick that up pretty quickly. But yeah, I, I mean, if the cat's got a preference that way, you may have to look at more shallow vessels. Great. Thank you. And then a great question. Do you have any tips for medicating these cats since many of these drugs don't have great transdermal absorption and the cat's condition is exacerbated by stress? Yeah. So over the years, I had my own cat practice for 13 years and we spent a lot of time working with caregivers. And as long as we're able to guide people through the various options for pilling, we can get there. One of the things I really like to recommend, and this is at before we ever have a sick cat is that we should actually be feeding pill pockets and pill assist to our healthy cats and kittens so that they get used to those types of things so that when it comes to having a medication in them, they don't really care. They like them so much, they eat them quickly. But I will work with caregivers on a one-on-one -on -one basis to try and figure out what works best for them. Every cat's going to be different. Every caregiver is going to be different in terms of the medication that they can get into the cat. And yeah, the transdermals don't really cut it in these situations. So we need to find alternatives and it's very cat and caregiver specific. Great. You know, my um, husband is not a veterinary professional. And I remember when my older cat had a dental and I'm tr in the corner trying to mm -hmm. post up um, syringe and buprenorphine sub -Q, uh, sublingually. And, you know, my cat was drooling post dental and he was really, really appalled. He's like, Seamus looks so uncomfortable. Why are you doing that? <laughs> you know, it's, so it's little things like, 
giving the injection of a long acting buprenorphine yeah. subcutaneously before they leave the hospital. So they don't have to touch that cat for 24 hours. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like we're way more empathetic when we have to do it for our own cat. So yeah. again, making sure that we're using appropriate analgesia, which leads me to the next question. What are your analgesics for cats and how long do you uh, dispense it for? So when they come into the hospital, if they're having a flare up, I certainly um, like to use drugs like buprenorphine. Um, it's one of my favorite ones for analgesia in cats. And I always kid around. I once heard a speaker say they thought all cats had a buprenorphine deficiency. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if that's really true, but they certainly benefit from it from when they're in pain. And from a multimodal perspective, I'll also, as long as they're hydrated and in good kidney function, I will use a non-steroidal injectable as well. And then we will also institute gabapentin if they're not already on it, because that also helps with their anxiety. And then when I do send them home, they're probably going to get a sub-Q injection of a three-day buprenorphine. Now, you guys are in the U.S., so you have Zorbium on topical buprenorphine, which is nice. We don't have that. Um, and then I'll also prescribe some non-steroidals and gabapentin longer term. Wonderful. Thank you. Now, um, I just wanted to, again, thank Royal Canaan and thank uh, Dr. Kelly St. Denis for giving this. And if you don't mind typing in your feedback, um, your thank yous, we'll make sure to pass those on to the speakers also. And again, this is on YouTube. So while you only get CE for watching it live, as long as you fill out the form that is in the chat, so make sure to fill that out right away. Again, you will find your CE certificate in my credits when you log into your Vecal account. If you don't have a Vecal account, you can have a free account, okay? Um, and that will uh, give you access to uh, be able to check out some of the CE. Um, so make sure you can uh, get your CE certificate there. All right, last question. What about starting um, calming care or water additives um, for some of these cats? And, you know, it's so interesting. I'm seeing a lot of vets and veterinary technicians whose own cats are battling with FIC. Um, so, you know, it makes us empathetic on it. This is a very, very common problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not familiar with specifically calming care. I'm not sure what product they're referring referring to, but I do use products that have like L-theanine or my milk hydrolysate in them. So a Soliquin, Anxetane or a couple that I can think of off the top of my head. If we're using the products like the stress food um, and we can, we can get those things already nutrients added to the food, um, but we can add those additionally if we need to in products like Soliquin and Anxetane. Wonderful. It's common care, which I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with. No worries. And, you know, I will honestly say having a cat uh, that has severe, severe food allergies, and it's most likely related to dairy. I have my own cat on Ultimino. And that's one of the things I love about that multifunction, because I know there are options where there's that urinary plus hydrolyzed. Yeah. Uh, for me, just seeing the urinary plus calm um, is so important because we all know these cats um, need more calm in their life, right? Yes. You were mentioning buprenorphine. They need more calm in their life too. So yes. love the fact that that multifunction is available. Um, again, I just want to thank all of you guys for attending. We know your life is crazy, whether or not you're watching this during the day, breakfast, coffee, whatever time zone you're in. I'm seeing a lot from uh, all over the world, which I absolutely mm -hmm. love. And I just want to thank all of you guys because uh, we've been so busy and with the holidays coming up. Um, we really appreciate all of you guys showing up to learn during the day. So thank all of you guys for coming also. And again, don't forget to fill out that form. I'm going to drop it in the chat one more time. Um, and again, please, the next time you see uh, your Royal Canaan rep, please make sure to give them a huge thank you. Um, and again, Dr. Uh, St. Denis, thank you so much for an awesome, awesome, clinically relevant practical CE uh, on all things CAP. We really appreciate it. Thank, thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.